podcast episode 46 this is Alex caravan swag manager of uh data science forgot my job title for a second uh <laughs> drinking a lagunita sucks lindley uh, kyle lindley sports engineer driving my baseball drinking a dry january water taking it easy this month it's been a been and we're gonna talk end. about that too <laughs> yeah. 2020 wrecked lindley so hard he's going sober That's- <laughs> yeah. uh and i mean anthony brady uh, sports scientist, biomechanist, uh, also drinking. Just kidding. I'm not drinking water. Uh, I got a little bit of wine. Petit Petit Syrah, courtesy suggestion of the great Gretchen Hoffman. So shout out Gretchen for the for the wine suggestion. Um, this is the Driveline R&D podcast. Research and drinks coming Dude, to you. We did a non-guest episode. Yeah, non-guest oh. episode. And... Yeah, yeah, Anthony. It's 2021. Podcast is officially across two separate years. We're a multi-year podcast now. That's right. That's right. Uh, Anthony, is uh, is your audio good in, in OBS? I think it's little, so. It's a little loud for me. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what I did was I so I turned I turned myself up in Zoom, but then turned myself down. Uh-oh. Uh, on OBS, so we're, I hope chilling. it's good. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. We're if good. anyone notices any like whack audio, just let me know. But I think it, I think it should be fine. So we'll see. Yeah, d- d- just let Brady know, and then I'll just talk for ten minutes straight while Brady tries to figure it out in the background. <laughs> yeah, just C- cover up. You the look audio so issues. funny, dude. When I rewatched the beginning of the episode, you're just like when you're like moving the Zoom screen share, you're just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm just looking around, I'm trying to like figure it all out. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like looking at the audio levels. God damn it, D- uh, dude! Lindley, you wanna? Um, I mean, first off, by the way, for for the for the viewers, for the listeners, um, I actually found out Lindley was doing a sober January a couple of days ago, and on the spot, on the spot, Facetimed him. <laughs> and dude, I'm not, I'm not a huge Facetimer. I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a huge Facetimer. But probably <laughs> two for three, two, dude. Dude, probably no, dude. I I think I'm like three for four on number of times I Facetime Lindley, and it looks like he just finished. What? Dude, Anyways, finished okay, <laughs> so. Yeah, so Lindley's going dry this month. Um, that's pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, it was just you know holiday season, enjoying enjoying the food, enjoying some drinks. Figured uh, starting off the year right with a dry, dry January uh, through February. Got a trip to California scheduled at the end of February, so that'll be the uh, celebrate. Nice, couple, <laughs> couple yeah. months dry. Then. You know what? Uh, just a quick note too for the listeners. Um, just to put things into context, because uh, I'll let I'll let the listeners decide, but I personally think it's you know pretty fucked up. But whatever. Um, for Christmas, I decided to give a gift to my fellow podcast <laughs> co-hosts, Lindley and, and Caravan. I actually got us uh, three months of the Craft Beer Club subscription, so we're gonna have like craft beers that we can we can crush on the podcast. Um, and I told them that on New Year's Eve. And then a few days later, Lindley tells me that he's going dry for January. Bro, so kind of kind of messed up, you know. That. Get get your boy uh, a gift, and then he's just like, "Nah, I ain't, I ain't drinking those." So I de- I definitely planned it before that, and I also messaged you. You're like, "No, no, it's cool, dude." Because I said, "What about what about drinks? I could just uh, it'll be an exception or whatever." Yeah. No, it's chill. Do, do, have you tried an avocado and chips chocolate I got you for Christmas? <laughs> Oh, I forgot that. That's still in there, actually. I need to try that. Have you had that? Dude. 
No, I got it for you, bro. Dude, I mean, yeah. if you want to give me a bite, if you want to give me a bite, I won't say no for sure. Yeah, well, I'm curious what it tastes mess like. with that afterward. Yeah, I forgot that's that's still up in the pantry. Unless your brother's uh, jacked it at this point. Well, hopefully gone. not, dude. That thing cost me eleven bucks. Oh, jeez, that's <laughs> expensive, expensive chocolate. Okay, uh, dude, this is like classic uh, intro. Uh, just dude, without a guess, we're lost. But yeah, well, I was about yeah, to say, dude. I'm I'm already I'm already at a screen share. Uh, um, if we want to go through the our, our first initial our first initial like clickbaity thing just going over last year's uh you know public baseball twitter r d bracket under 5k followers um yeah 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 i can right. uh, i can switch your screen share over to you you got me should be should be good now okay that was also so, a nice nice addition there caravan at the top care clause was yeah, that, yeah that was after like the second round or something yeah, yeah, I, 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 uh, I photoshopped that in. Shout out Christian Hook. He used, he made a carrot claws joke in an internal like base camp post, and just copied and pasted. I mean, this whole bracket's so janky, dude. I was making, <laughs> I was like, because I'm, I'm not even underscore V nine. Yeah, dude, this is the ninth edition of it because I was doing <laughs> one for each round, and, and I'll be honest, this is a little bit behind the scenes because you guys saw like first round, I did a tweet thread of thirty two people, and I was trying to make them like actually decent quality posts, you know. Not just like randomly uh, hyperlinking like random ones that like, you know, random articles of theirs. So I was like, OK, I spend like I was spending time on each one, but there's no way I was going to do that ahead of time and be able to turn around the first round, like, you know, right off the bat. Like, I didn't yeah. want to like. Uh, so what I was doing is for the first couple rounds, uh, I was checking in with like, you know, four hours to go. And I, the ones that were like no hopers, I just started writing them initially and just axing them out. But I figured if for some reason, like someone. It, you know, if, if like, well, let's say Hook, if Hook like pulled off a huge comeback against Joe, I won't, I didn't like my only addition of it. I didn't want my only addition of this to be like, you know, Hook crossed that. I could just go back to like V2 or whatever. Oh, yeah. So I was just doing, I was just saving. I was just being super like trying to save myself time. Um, but, uh, but, but anyways, I, I was going to say, I was going to break it down in like kind of like uh quadrant and, and just see like, uh, well, you got anything that surprised you guys from each each bracket, and talk a little bit about like, um, I mean, I, I thought the competition was fun. We, we got a Slack channel out of it, uh, which hasn't been too too popping, but I haven't been really been in it as much either. I'm thinking like some holidays, but already there's been like some good discussion in there. I think. Yeah. Um, but we, we we can start with this one. We'll call this the the North Northwest bracket. <laughs> what do you got on this one? <laughs> the, the final four that codify the the. Uh, Eventual be, winner emerged out of. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't even know. I had never seen Codify. I didn't know if that was like. Uh, I noticed it, it seemed like kind of a, a like a business. That's the name of the company or business or service he provides, right? Yeah, I never I heard, heard of it. I, you never heard of Codify? No. Oh, interesting. Well, dude, I, I, I'll be honest, and I mean, I, I've talked to Codify a little bit in, in DMs. I was very surprised he. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised he came out of this, much less won the whole thing, because I didn't think he had the most publicity besides that Alex Fast article on Pitcher List, to be honest. Mm. But, but I mean, a bunch of his clients came out, a bunch of like pro pitchers came out, um, oh, which really? hey, like I thought, yeah, yeah, like people he he works with. Because for anybody not in the, in the anybody not in the know, essentially, Codify does. Uh, I mean, this is this is very underselling all the work he puts in it, but he does customizable heat maps for pitchers, um, and. They're really cool. They they get kind of like, he kind of like imposes the heat map on top of like the video, and people were like retweeting out like some of his work, uh, pitching ninja, which I know you got a bone to pick with, Lindley. <laughs> yeah. um, supported him a bunch. Hell, Rob. But uh, but no, I, I was gonna say we we had we had a, a a bunch of like we had some biomechanists in here too, Buffy, Ben Hansen. Um, yeah, Ben Hansen versus like, Buffy first round. I mean, that's just tough, you know. That's like Robert Fry with a with a good showing as well. I was, oh yeah, I was impressed. I thought Nikolai uh, getting first rounded was uh, didn't, <laughs> didn't see that. You know, I mean, podcast guest. I figured you know that would have helped, but yeah, podcast guest. I mean, I mean, he he's not very he he preaches about a lot of stuff, so he's not like yeah. ex, especially in grand, especially in the in the baseball community. But he posts some like you know, I mean, he ha, he has some very OG uh, blog articles. If you were to look up like Nikolai Ukavenko, yeah, uh, even back in 2011, he was talking about like uh, the the regress regression value of adding one mile of velocity to pitches. Yep, you know, essentially like stuff that we wouldn't think too much of now, but 
that was when like nobody was really talking about it and, and he was really leveraging the public data. No, yeah. Robert Frey had a, had a really good run, dude, which is, um, which is not too surprising. I mean, the man puts out so much content and, yeah, and works yeah, with so true. many people. Um, speaking of, speaking of Nikolai, uh, I think maybe he got inspired. He, he put out a baseball tweet about front offices. Yeah. Uh, just a, a couple of days ago and dropped yeah. a blog. His Twitter's been f- a fire the last yeah. week. I'm not going to lie. It's been one of my, my, uh, <laughs> my co- more exciting follows in the last like couple of weeks. Oh yeah, dude. Uh, Nikolai, Nikolai's a good follow for sure. So if you guys are listening, we're just going to get Nikolai like 12 followers out of this podcast. <laughs> I haven't That's been me. We should have asked him what's the, what is the, like, what is his Twitter handle? Is that just like an alias? Uh, we got to move on. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I was going to say Ben, ben Howell had a, had a really good showing and put up a bunch of, I think he put on his KBO write-ups on a maps uh, on the mm. map. Well, maybe multiple maps, uh, which, 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 you know, kind of went under the radar. He puts in like so much quality work. He just puts out like KBO write-ups that are like six, seven pages deep, uh, tons of like, you know, s- saber metrics, some specific like linear weights in the KBO, I believe. Um, yeah. Matt, she knows a good one too. Um, he, he runs, he runs a pretty, he runs a small pod too. state street spot street pod shout out. They had a good episode of Ethan Moore. Um, okay. Moving on to this bracket. Uh, this one, Patrick Brennan, dude, Patrick Brennan almost got, uh, almost fell off in the first round of Kevin Pope and then just, just smoked everyone else, dude. Yeah. Great, crazy support behind Brennan. Uh, he's just been, he's just been part of the baseball community for so long. I think like he's been, he's been writing blog posts and posting on hardball times for years. He's just so young. Yeah, but yeah, he just he just completely moted through after the first round. Uh, otherwise, dude, honestly, I'll be honest with you with with you, Lindley. I, I was I was kind of pissed. I was pissed when when our when our our uh, coworker and friend Stokey, and I don't care if Stokey hears this, dude. I was kind of pissed when Stokey knocked off Bill Petty, dude. Bill Petty to <laughs> me is one of the uh, godfathers of public open source data runs. In my mind, one of the best uh, repos out there. Just uh, done a ton for the community. Uh, Stokey <laughs> tweeting about mini hitting plyos. Retw- I mean, he retweets a lot of good content, and he, he's super active. So, I mean, he's certainly not a bad uh, not a bad fall. But I was like, oh man, my, my yeah. boy Stokey too powerful. <laughs> a couple of these matchups were tough, dude. I was laughing at. Uh... I didn't see that one at first, but then I saw Hook versus Joe. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's oh, ruthless. Hook versus Joe, Hook I mean, versus Joe I, first round I mean, is real tough. For his, for Intern versus your department record. director. Yeah. Dude, yeah. There, there, there's a bunch of underrated stuff in here, too. Um, Andy Kim. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Eccentric Laddie, which, by the way, uh, Lynn, it's another one that you that you volunteered. Uh, you know, Eccentric Laddie has his, his, uh, his tweets on private. Because oh, Jake's, yes. Jake's message me, he's like, Dude, I can't even see Centric Laddie's tweets. Are they good? And I was like, I mean, yeah, they're pretty good. But like, <laughs> I can't believe he won. I can't believe he got to like what? What is that? Uh, only the second round, yeah, but, just but first with, round. with private tweets, dude. With yeah. private tweets, that was nuts. Um, Socks Moneyball uh, puts in a ton of work in his stuff. Uh, Denton Sagerman, another past guest. Uh, I was gonna say Daniel Tucker, sick run under 500 followers, dude. Under 500 followers. Uh, I mean, I don't know if he still has under 500, but he did at the time Oof. of the run. Uh, moving on to, for for um, in my mind, probably the most... Th- th- this side of the bracket was more stacked. I talked about Lindley with this in real time. Uh, I think this... I think Lindley... Lindley, I think you 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 did yourself proud of an Elite, elite 8 run, dude. Yeah. Uh, you you ran into the, to Barn Smith, who, I mean, I, I think... <laughs> I think right now the plan is to have uh, Bart come on next week as a guest, but yeah, especially if pitching ninja support and, and a ton of like MLB players and well, not a ton of MLB players, but like you know, well-known people also supporting Bart, dude. That was that was and a uh, Roto wear shirt. Yeah, yeah, dude. Weed references, bro. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that's a guaranteed. That's how do I you compete with dude, that? When I voted for Bart, dude, I made a hundred burner caps and voted for Bart. Sorry, Lindley. I fucking I can, I can tell you now three weeks after the fact. <laughs> Damn. Uh, round two, I was like, I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna beat uh oh, Mike, on? Mike's on because I was like, this this guy's that's a tough done draw. Way tough draw for more, Son. way more for the uh for yeah. the baseball community than I <laughs> dude, dude, you, you, you know what it minutes. is. You, you you know what it is with Son. If he had shown his uh, kitchen. 
This yeah. kid just set up earlier, dude. Yeah, if so, any of you guys, so, uh, what, what was that? What was that? What was that? Kinetic Pro and uh, Pro Pitch AI. Yeah, yeah. Right? The product it was, it was, reveal the K bands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you guys check out, if you guys Google uh, Kinetic Pro and Pitch AI collab, you'll see uh, our good friend Mike Son has a stunning. Yeah. kitchen backdrop man we need to have you talked to him about that brady yeah we need to we need to run back the uh the son as a guest just to get that uh get that background um so you can just flex that it's new his new I'm place looks sweet find... dude yeah but anyways uh so some really good i mean mlb moving average did really well too a couple a couple fantasy accounts here by the way man uh some of the fantasy accounts here are, are really um uh, really informative and, and are super active so so i'm not surprised they had a bunch of fans um bottom bracket just gonna say uh i mean this is this one this bracket was super diverse dude even looking at the first couple people you have a uh ex-pro pitcher who works for driveline uh brian mcafee who who like kind of started a startup in baseball analytics mike wrestler the cto of one of the bigger tech companies in baseball mm-hmm. and, and, and beth werner who, who's a coach now and has done has done a bunch of work of baseball perspectives and is like you know, one of the leading women in the field and got a ton of support. Uh, just like the, a very diverse uh, court, uh, like, yeah, yeah. corner of the Ethan bracket. Moore. Ethan, Ethan Moore, Ethan Moore, uh, I mean, yeah, dude. Ethan, Ethan messaged me right after I made a bracket saying that he technically had just accepted a pro team offer. I told him to keep it on the deal until he either got uh, bounced from the bracket or the bracket was over. Yeah. To not disqualify him. But I was just thinking it'd be funny if you end up winning the whole thing, which I think he wasn't too far off from. Yeah. Very, very tight loss to... Jake Stone, who who ended up uh, losing the finals, but yeah, Sam Bornstein as well. Tamp, dude. Uh, yeah, very very underrated. Also, Jared Cross um, made a steamer projections, pu- pu- pushed out some super high quality uh, ar- articles. So yeah, like this 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 side of the bracket was was crazy. Anyways, yeah, that, that's that's my that's my review. Definitely some surprises in there. Uh, thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, got, got a lot of people in the in the. In, in a baseball Twitter Slack channel. So if you want to re- reach out to me about that or whatever, let me know. But yeah, that, that, that was a lot of fun. And it got also uh, underrated effect. Got uh, got Brady out of the out of his Twitter hibernation. Oh, that's right. Oh, wow. Dude, yeah. uh, I almost cried. I almost cried. You see, he just like messaged, uh, <laughs> he almost mess or he messaged me in caravan was like, it's time. I was like, what? <laughs> and then uh, and then he comes with this super genuine like shout out uh, for me to try to beat try to beat Bart. I was like, damn, guy came out of retirement just to uh shout me out. Love is real. And, and then and then a, I still hit him with the dry January. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. I, I actually I was really at first I didn't want to promote like myself during this like tournament too much because I was like, I don't know if that's a bad look. Like basically telling people to vote for you and that you're you're like super great <laughs> like a great account to follow. I was like, I don't know how it's gonna look but I think it was accepted pretty well from the from the baseball community. Like I talked to a couple of people and they said it was really cool. They like we're really glad you did it to help get like show the, the like a lot of people who want to learn more about baseball. It was like a good place, like centralized place for people to go and find good accounts to follow. So I think it was I think it was pretty fire. Yeah. Especially just like making uh creating just like more public access and options and then trying to like, you know, spread that across uh all the all the platforms that we had. I mean, even Bodie had some, uh, you know, Bodie's like quote tweet on the R and D podcast stuff, uh, was what do you say? Just saying how, like, you know, us as a group always wanting to like make our stuff public, doing what we can for like baseball research, baseball tech, that kind of a thing. Uh, I'll be honest. I didn't see that. <laughs> Damn, that's ruthless. I think it might've actually time been a, now, dude. Oh dude, it might've been a notifications. Qu- <laughs> it, it was a quote tweet of the, of mine, the gif. The the Lindley gift that I tweeted out, oh. um, <laughs> so but he had some nice words about that. But oh yeah, do we want to talk about what you were saying? Because I got no. a lot of people asking me. Yeah, no, what was be twice this podcast, dude? Yeah, what was that? Uh, <laughs> why were you laughing so hard? What was that about? That was really funny. The people really will funny. never know. <laughs> people will never know. I didn't know until I, you had to show me the video. Know, no, no. Yeah. If you want to I just forgot. DM me, I'll give you the audio. I'll give you the version of audio. <laughs> Oh no, that's true. All right, we got we got four topics uh, Let's roll, baby. to to get into. We're we're twenty minutes deep, so we gotta. Oh, it's four twenty. Nice. We gotta get rolling. All right, first up, count induced pitch type differences. That's all I got. 
Oh yeah. Um, I mean, dude, should, should I just go? I'll, I can just go back to screen sharing because I, I tweeted about this okay. the other day. Um, let me get my incriminating tabs out of the way. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, dude, tagged tagged you tagged you Darvish in this does not did not follow me back. Actually, to, actually, no. To be fair, I didn't follow him. So there we go. Oh, now we'll expect the. Yeah, yeah, we, we see it during the podcast. Yeah, yeah. While I'm screen sharing it. You uh, Anyways, so, so this is a project that I, I've been working on with um, um, Connor Hinchcliffe, uh, Daniel Coyne, uh, Jack Bredesen, who's now with the Mets, but was working with uh, Driveline before. But the idea being, do people's moving metrics like change during, depending on what count it is? And I kind of used a not cheap example. I used like one of the biggest examples, you Darvish's cutter which a lot of people, or not a lot of people, but like some people know that he's talked about throwing different types of cutters when he's ahead of the count and ahead in the count versus other count states, which I think is very obvious by this graphic. Oh, uh, wow, basically, yeah. basically shows the density distribution of his vertical break. And you can see, I mean, it, it seems like he throws it maybe a little bit harder uh, in an even count versus a behind count. But when he's ahead, he, th- he I mean, he throws it harder and gets more lift on it uh, for sure. Um, and, and I talked, we talked about like examining a lot of differences. And, and yeah. one of the things we're talking about internally is how do you know if a difference is big enough? Like, okay, so-and-so throws it 0.8 miles harder ahead of the count. Is that enough? Is that noise? Is that small sample size? Is that just a different pitch type? And, and the different pitch type is, is a little bit trickier to answer. Like, I think, I think this can help bring light to, uh, people that do throw different pitch types based on their count state and also, just be, just like whatever natural variation there exists in their pitches anyways. But uh, one of the things I wanted to do is to kind of tell how much, uh, you know, how, how much movement metrics like correlate across like, uh, you know, like a sequence of pitches as well. So, so what yeah. I did here again, this is, this is, this is mainly, I did this on vertical break for the sake of the tweet, but I have a table at the bottom. That's more, uh, you know, that kind of covers a couple of the big metrics. And also internally, we're going to be tackling not just vertical break, you know, horizontal break, velocity, spin rate, maybe spin efficiency as well, and then put together a blog on it. Uh, but the idea being that like uh, here, like the, 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 the first, the X, first X, first like X pitches don't really map correlate that well with like, you know, the next X pitches in terms of vertical break. So it's not something that, you know, is reliably, higher in the beginning of the season or later in the season. Um, and like, like one of the, gra- I didn't really explain this graphic, but that was like kind of my point here as well. Like the idea here was just each game, each start that you had just as cutters vertical break. Oh yeah. Cause we're talking about just as cutter to be clear. Uh, not, not like a ton of, I mean, his, his first, his first uh, start, he, he threw a pretty hard and had got a, quite a bit of lift on it, but you know, it's not really like a, a game dependent stat it wasn't like the first half of the season he was throwing his cutter like soft and not getting much lift on it and all of a sudden second half of the season he went ham yeah. it's not really that it's it's more dependent on the actual count so uh what I, what i what i looked at doing is i looked at like calculating the variance between counts for all qualifying pitchers and getting kind of a cutoff value this is the average like variation uh for like the main uh main pitch types and also the metrics I mentioned before and what, what I'm, we're probably going to do internally. What I was saying was I think the distribution itself isn't necessarily like super normal, but we do have like enough data to kind of invoke the central limit theorem, law of large numbers, which implies that like once the more data you get, the more it like uh, starts getting closer, the, mm-hmm. the more the sample distribution gets closer to normal distribution. Uh, so what we're probably going to do is, uh, I'm rec- I'm going to recommend that we use these cutoffs times like the times like a, a, a standard deviation of like or like a, a like a Z score of like two two point three to go along with an alpha level of 0.01. Whereas like for the people that are more familiar with hypothesis tests, usually you'd go with an alpha level of 0.05. That's the classic like p value. Yeah. Um, just to be like a little bit conservative, might as well go with an alpha level of 0.01. And so so what that what that would look like is for example. Uh, the cutter uh, cutter vertical break is 0.448, so probably anything above 1.2. Uh, 
is going to stand out in our in our analyses, which spoiler alert, use cutter ahead and account. Again, it's like four inches of lift extra. Um, and again, use use this kind of a special example because he definitely has talked about throwing different different types of cutters based on account. So yeah. that's kind of that's kind of the what we're working on, and I'm I'm pretty excited about the. I mean, except for the write up, some analysis has already been done. So at this point, it's kind of putting everything together, putting everything together, looking in the specific pitches that stand out, and yeah, publishing it. Yeah, that seems uh, that seems like pretty intuitive, but like uh, quantifying something that is intuitive, like um, definitely the the way pitches are thrown, um, you know. Like from from my like personal playing days, just like a head in the count, O two slider is very different than like oh slider, one oh slider. Same with fastballs too. Like even just like uh anything that's thrown. And it's not like it's a different pitch, same pitch, just with different like intensity and stuff. Yeah, and to give you guys a preview of what those numbers look like, when we're at two point three two six, um, we'll probably be publishing a blog, but these are kind of the cutoffs we're gonna use to determine, you know, any single thing different. So for example, if you move your pitch by a mile or more based on counts, that's going to stand out as significant for everything but a uh, curveball, mm. where the criteria is going to be 1.25. Nice. Yeah. Gotcha. That's tight. That is tight. You has not followed me back, though, so that is not <laughs> tight, dude. Damn. I'm going to DM him right now. I was going to say, I got super hyped during the bracket. Darren Woman, hit, 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 uh, you too, Caravan, right? Hit us back, hit us with a follow. Let me see, dude. I'm about to put him on blast. Yeah, yeah, Darren <laughs> Woman follows me. I was gonna say, you told me he did, so yeah, yeah. I, was, I was trying to flex. Yeah, <laughs> what do we got next, uh, Anthony? We got Arizona and Texas training, kind of just oh, a yeah. uh, bit of a bit of a bouncing announcement. Um, yeah, 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 take it away on this, Brady. Driveline's going to Texas. Oh, yes, a guzzle the wine. Yeah, driveline. <laughs> driveline's going to Texas and Arizona. Uh, Texas training starts to... starts uh, this week, actually Wednesday, uh, in in two days. So Arizona starts on the eighteenth, I believe. Yeah, day one of uh, Arizona training in Phoenix will be on the eighteenth. We've already got a couple people down in Texas. Um, so pitching and hitting. Same same training. You get up here. We've got a couple of facilities uh, lined up at each location where we can uh, be working with athletes. So like extending our reach um, and just you said a like couple of facilities. With, each work location? with more people. Uh, a couple of facilities, as in two, one at each place. Oh, not not quite uh, multiple facilities at multiple uh, locations just yet. And then at the end of this month, and at the end of every month for the next like I believe three to four months uh kyle lindley and i will be traveling to each location with the mobile mocap lab doing some uh motion capture assessments so right now you can you can sign up for um either of those if you or anyone you know is training in the dallas area or the phoenix area and they want a, a motion capture assessment we'll be in town uh at the end of this month and at the end of every month uh going going forward so we got a little little diversity so we did the arizona thing earlier this year um had some pretty good success and just want to you know uh bring driveline and make driveline as available as we can to to as many people so good opportunity to start expanding out there getting some satellite facilities going that kind of thing the place in the place in it's dbat right the place in texas pretty pretty big Yep. We could we could train a lot of people there, yeah. Yep, DBAT, DBAT Arlington. So should be uh yeah, there's like quite a bit of space. They have a ton of cages as is, and um they've given us quite a bit of space to work with in terms of training athletes and working stuff. I mean, we'll have everything there. Like all the the same exact tech that we have up here, plyo walls, equipment, um, all that, and you know, sending a bunch of our uh, best skill coaches to kind of like uh, train and work with athletes. So a lot of a uh, lot of product options in terms of like you can you can just train there regularly. We've got assessments, we've got snapshots, we've got like pitch design sessions, all that stuff. So 
uh, you can get get dialed with uh, the driveline customer relations team and, and get signed up for those. So it's pretty exciting. Yep. A bunch of people have talked about uh, driveline wanting to expand for a while, so yeah, kind of cool. We'll be in multiple places now. Yeah, it'll be good, and it'll also be tight for uh, you know for Lindley and I specifically to go and get some get some much needed sunlight. That'll be that's right. That'll be dope. Um, actually, in preparation to get used uh, to the amount of light we're gonna get, I got one of those uh, light therapy <laughs> lights. You know, happy lights, dude. This thing. Check out how freaking bright this is, <laughs> dude. Oh, dude. Dude, just blood the pupils of whoever is watching. Dude, this thing is nuts, man. Freaking, <laughs> it's unreal how bright this is, dude. Look at that. Don't don't get too close to Jagger's with that thing. He might actually, you know, get the boys some light too. Yeah, I I mean, <laughs> dude, this is like. This is exactly what I needed with these, with the sun being out for an hour a day in Seattle. So uh, I'm getting prepared for Arizona and Texas uh, right now. So very, very excited. Nice. Yeah, I, I, I just saw Jake's today uh, for the first time in a while. Well, at least a month. Looking as pale as ever, dude. He walked in with the most, like, um, the most covered he could be. You know, like you have those like mask wraps that you kind of like you can hang up here, dude. He had them like all the way up to his eyeballs, bro. And he, yeah. had, his, uh, he had his glasses over him. Yeah, and he had his didn't hat he pulled down. Ridiculously, yeah. Then he looked ridiculously covered up. I'm like, dude, it's okay to uh, get like some light. Like you don't have to have your whole body covered. Like it's not like yeah. like COVID's not gonna get infiltrated through your temple, dude. You're all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was very covered. Uh, yeah, I, I actually think that uh, Jigs, Jigs and Bodie are gonna be in uh, Texas. Uh, oh, this right. weekend, so they'll be they'll be down there later this week. Um, hopefully, get more people to to kind of like uh, train there and show up. So it'll be what, it'll what, be pretty what tight. You say? Late night what? Lifts. We, we're oh, lifts. Yeah, I thought you said late night libs, dude. I'm like, you know, what? wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Anyways, yeah, but that's that's Arizona and Texas training. So uh, we got spots up in there. MoCap Lab is going to be heading there. Um, yeah, that's really all I got on uh, Arizona and Texas. Extra training right. options. I'm excited to get back to travel, man. I'm really excited for that. Yeah, 2021, get that gold gold medallion status. Yeah, Brady, Brady, what do you think? Do you think we can swing a uh, podcast listener 10 percent off or something uh, in Arizona or Texas? If someone mentions the podcast or they want to sign up for an assessment or train there and we will pay 10%. Yes, we will pay 10% I will. I will literally pay 10%. Like just DM me uh, or any of us on Twitter and we'll Venmo you the 10%. Or, so, or better yet, better yet. Just comment below saying, yo, uh, yeah. I actually want to we'll actually want to train and send proof that you're trying to train there. Yep. And then we'll just pitch it to our marketing manager and exactly. be like, exactly. Yep, Keep that the money that'd be big for us. So, one hundred percent, super really on that. DM like screenshots. Sign up, sign up for shot. the sign up for the training. Uh, <laughs> screenshot it, DM it to any of us, and you know, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, uh, whatever. You know, we'll we'll, we'll pay that ten percent. XRP. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we have no clearance to uh, do that, but we're gonna we're gonna do it. So, let's go, baby. Um. Okay. Uh, next block next topic, lead leg block uh, metrics. So blocking. Uh, last week, last week was it last week, two weeks ago. Dean, I was Dean, you better be with... listening right now. Dean Jackson, <laughs> yeah. pay attention to this part okay. of the podcast. So without force plates. Okay, I'll start by so the lead leg block and I'm gonna DM then, Dean right now. By the way, so he's actually gonna hop on. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Just kidding. He, this he, is a guest he, episode. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, impromptu guest in the in the pod cool uh so the lead leg block we talk about its primary purpose being uh basically like being strong and stable for the body to rotate on help facilitate some pelvis rotation so like kind of pr- push uh backwards on the on the front side of the pelvis help uh kind of continue rotating and and basically we measure an effective lead block right now without force plates because typically um, a lot of the analyses that have, uh, that are in literature right now are they kind of correlate 
the X direction, the direction between home and the r- pitching rubber as being a good predictor of, of velo or the best predictor of velo out of the, out of the force, like ground reaction force metrics. Yep. But we don't have force blades right now. So we've been looking at lead, lead leg extension. So basically as the knee straightens out, we use that as a proxy for the front leg prov- push, like pushing into the ground yep. and uh, creating ground reaction force. Um, so that's been our current like method of, uh, measuring lead leg block. <clears throat> and so we look at lead leg extension velocity at foot plant and at ball release and at, uh, at maximum. And then, uh, so the other day I was, I was looking at, cause we, we talk a lot about how an effective block stops the linear momentum of the pitcher. So we like somebody with a good, like you want a good drive towards, uh, towards home plate with your back leg. And then you want your lead leg to block that momentum and kind of transfer that momentum up the chain into rotational energy, for example. So I was thinking, what if instead of trying to basically measure the lead leg block with lead knee extension, why don't we just measure how much momentum was actually blocked by using uh, basically like the the linear velocity of the body. So we measure, we call it center of gravity velocity and just basically how fast your body's moving from the rubber towards home plate. Right. So, um, took, so my first, uh, analysis took the maximum velocity in that direction. And then, uh, sorry, took the minimum velocity between foot plane and ball release. So after your front lead leg lands and before the ball is released, what is the slowest that you're moving towards the plate? And then dividing by your maximum velocity in that direction. So that was like my way of measuring how much, um, how much of that maximum velocity towards the plate, that maximum momentum that you're creating uh, with your back, with your drive, are you blocking with the front leg? Right. And uh, found that it it was it explained more of the variance in uh, velo than the lead knee extension at foot plant, um, but not as much as lead knee extension at ball release. Um, so that was the first one. I was I was pretty excited about that. But then. A few days later, I looked at just, if I just looked at momentum, so I took the maximum momentum minus that minimum momentum. So I took the max center of gravity velocity times your body weight to get momentum since momentum is mass times velocity, and then subtracted the minimum momentum between foot plane and ball release, that absolute amount of momentum that was blocked uh, in that time period explains like 30% of the variance in velo, which is way more than leading extension. Yeah. However, mass alone explains like 25% <laughs> yeah. of the yeah. velo, which is something the caravans mentioned on the pod before, but so this is like a slight improvement over mass. Yeah. Um but but it's pretty exciting. Uh it's kind of might end up kind of being useless once we get force plates because we can actually have like force like total force uh applied into the into the ground b- between foot plane and ball release or um, yeah, like the, the total input, uh, total impulse, total energy, whatever, uh, however you want to quantify it, but yeah. it's pretty exciting. I think it could be an improvement, uh, in the meantime, before we, before we, uh, get those force plates installed in the mound. Yeah. I think another one, uh, one thing that came to mind when you did that was, um, as far as using like COG, uh, calculations and that philosophy would be doing like a similar one, but changing, um, the center of gravity to like not the center of gravity of the whole body, but doing it just by like a uh, segment. So you could do it ju- just by like, honestly, by like just the pelvis or the lower mm-hmm. half, but you probably wouldn't want to do the lower half completely because like the back leg is going to swing through a bit. So maybe it's like the front leg and the pelvis because with COG velo, like, cause, cause like theoretically, if you block really well, your torso would like project forward anteriorly faster, right? Mm-hmm. So that could be like an offsetting effect in that the difference in the, the COG velocity, if you block well compared to if like you don't block well, and then the whole, um, you know, COG velo just keeps moving kind of a thing. Cause I'd be interested to see if like anterior posterior, uh, trunk movement, increased not not uh like tilt relative but just like along the x towards the plate if Mm -hmm. uh that like the center of gravity actually that's probably how you do it instead of trying to isolate out 
the center of gravity of the lower half, you look at the center of gravity of the upper half of the torso and, and the arm and see if that like accelerates or moves faster, you know, towards the plate following from the, the block. block yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um, Interesting. There's also, it also came to mind that, uh, Kyle Wasserberger did a few months ago, we talked about it uh, on the pod, I think, but he did an analysis of energy transfer and did, there's a couple of metrics that he used with rotational energy and also linear energy. Yeah. I think there might be a way to do that with um, yeah. some, like if we looked at that difference in momentum uh, of the center of gravity and yeah. see if that like transfers into rotational energy, the torso, I feel like, or yeah, yeah. Of the, that's of the probably, torso or something in the upper body might, might be kind of fire. That's a really good point. That's probably a way better one to look at. Like even just thinking about like COG velo, like linear, linear kinetic energy uh, is, I bet, I bet if you did the same, uh, stuff you were just doing. And instead of using COG velo, just did like linear kinetic energy, um, towards the plate. I, I feel like you'd a- explain it. Um, well, the same, the same, uh, inputs for kinetic energy are, are used in the momentum calculation. So, Oh yeah. So that works then. Yeah. Cause you're taking care of that. Cause you include mass, uh, mm-hmm. in that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And by the way, we got a question from uh, the one and only Deaton Jackson in the chat. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> he, asked, he asked, how do you think analyzing force play data paired with mocap data will change the understanding around a block? Uh, probably overhaul it um, completely, honestly. I mean, we have like pretty good uh, theories, I think, right now. What will we'll be, we'll be like some of the first things you guys would want to look at? Uh, just that, that alone. Uh, relative um, force, so like... Uh, percentage of body weight force in um, that like anterior posterior uh, direction and it's like effects on rotational uh, pelvis and torso kinematics mainly um, uh, on that front but I mean I think I think that'll be pretty big but I, I also think <laughs> honestly force plates are going to do more for event tagging in the the initial um implementation Mm. of them like uh, it's just going to increase the accuracy of like labeling foot plant we probably won't even use foot plant we'll create like events relative to the the force plate metric so there will be like foot contact which would be like the first time that the foot touches the ground uh when you become like weight bearing so when the front leg accepts a hundred percent of your body weight worth of force and then going from there being like okay you know do harder throwers achieve like 2.5 x their body weight 3 x their body weight whatever it is uh kind of a thing um and then using that to kind of like shape the events and the kinematics uh around it yeah i was gonna say the the timing of it is is more interesting to me because lately i've uh i was talking to anthony about it before the pod but it's like lately i've been going down this uh rabbit hole of like if foot plant we use it right now as a standard metric where like we we kind of hope or we we try to get guys to be in a certain uh position or whatever at at foot plant Mm -hmm. and really maybe it's not about when the foot actually contacts the ground but we want you to be in a position when you start applying force with your front leg so your front leg can be down and we talk about how we don't want your front knee like tracking forward, we don't want your front knee bending. So your body's moving towards the plate more. We want your lead leg to, to do the block. Yeah. Um, but maybe it's okay if it, if your knee bends a little bit more when right after you land, if your body's not in the position to actually, um, take advantage of that. So that it's mm-hmm. not as much a foot plant that matters. Um, but like when, like where you are, when you start producing force. Yeah. And I think another thing too is going to be like, um, uh, I mean, this is kind of like along the lines of what we're doing with the, the bucket stuff as is, but maybe a more intensive, um, athlete typing type thing within the, uh, area of blocks, like being able to categorize different types of movers with how they, they foot strike. I mean, if like, this is something that's done in running and gait research as is right like in jogging you can be like a four foot striker a mid foot striker or a toe uh toe striker so like the way that you land on the ground uh can affect like your gait cycle and i'm i assume 
that that's likely the same on the pitching mound. Um, like I have seen heel strikers, I've seen toe strikers, I've seen midfoot strikers. And so the way in which they, they land and strike the ground is probably going to, you know, affect the way that they uh, move kinematically. We'll probably see that. Um, another one being the, the way that the impulse uh, works or that impulse works. Impulse is just changing momentum. So there are many ways to achieve changing momentum. Um, and it's kind of like a continuum of, of time and amount of force. So you can apply a lot of force really quickly or a little force over a long period of time. There's not necessarily, at least as far as we know, a good or a bad on this continuum. It's just the way in which you do it, right? And that was another thing Lily and I were talking about earlier in terms of the timing of it all, right? You can be uh, late, you can be closed if you change momentum in a way that is a little amount of force over a longer time. Because as long as you're still changing that momentum, you are transferring it. Um, and then if you are going to be really open and strike the ground with a lot of force very, very quickly, uh, you can be open and you'll create the same amount of, of impulse to change that momentum uh, and transfer it uh, efficiently. So, I mean, I'm really interested to see like how much more we can learn in terms of those different types of movement strategies because we have a lot of theories based on just their kinematics alone. Um, understanding the, the force play data. It's also going to be a way easier way to just understand like strength indexes um, and like relative strength athlete to athlete and how that affects uh, kinematics. Last thing uh, before, unless, unless you have, uh, have something, Caravan, uh, before getting into the article review, I think that like we talk about efficiency a lot, like efficiency as far as VLO per like joint kinetics or like even uh, for this block metric, I was talking about efficiency because like how much do you slow down versus how much do you create? And I think that could be interesting because if we have the force plate or when we have the force plate in the back at, with the drive foot and with the lead foot, you could see like, okay, you create this much force with your back foot. How much of this do you take advantage of uh, with your front? Yeah. And are, are you like taking advantage of, of all the force you create with your backside? Yeah. Uh, and I'll, I mean, I'll also add that like, um, force plates are adding in force plate data to the mocap data. It is going to matter for like the way that we understand the block, the way that we understand mechanics and all that. But honestly, it's going to have a much greater, uh, impact in terms of the way that we, uh, understand, um, kinetics, joint kinetic calculations across the whole entire body and the potential for like forward dynamics, which we've like talked about plenty of times as like, you know, the, the black box, uh, computed muscle control stuff that, you know, uh, Joe has been, uh, working off and on on, but having that data collected will allow that because we'll be able to, uh, calculate joint kinetics across the whole system from the ground reaction forces, right? We'll now actually have the ground reaction forces, um, to then understand like just connecting uh, the kinetics from from joint to joint across the free body diagram um, to to be able to do that. So like those, I mean, those findings and, and that type of research and investigation is most likely way over the head of like the general, you know, baseball research uh, follower and more like, you know, biomechanists will, will understand that. Um, but we're going to get way more value, uh, understanding that better than, than just like understanding mechanics, honestly. Uh, I was going to say one, one thing, um, actually, no, I was going to ask a very simple question. When is the, cause, cause I've heard so many updates on it. I just kind of like zone them out. What, what is the current update on, on force plate, uh, stuff in the lab? Oh, uh, it should be this month. So. Well, this could be. <laughs> I mean, I guess I say that now when that's been the answer right, for the last like three yeah, months. I, I have heard uh, like seven times. I feel yeah, like. yeah, that's totally fair. Um, yeah, I mean, COVID has just kind of like created constant delays with uh, contractors and what we're able to do. I think we finally have yeah. uh, one in place to where we can get the concrete poured um, at some point this month. But honestly, the way that things have been going and with uh, 
COVID complications. I wouldn't be surprised if it's, uh, you know, delayed again. 2022, but, baby. Okay, let's, yeah, let's do exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, January 2022, driveline gets force plates. <clears throat> yeah. All right, Lindley, let, let it rip on the article review. And thanks, Dean, for uh, hopping in. And uh, I have no idea how Dean hopped in, by the way, right when we were talking about it. That was crazy. Incredible. Huh? He's got a sixth sense. <laughs> he hears, uh, he's, he's got like a bot yeah. that just scrapes the yeah. whole entire internet for lead leg block being mentioned. And, and he just like gets, <laughs> gets cued in uh, right away. Um, oh, yeah. Also, listeners, uh, I mean, Dean just commented. Uh, click on Dean's, you know, um, just go to go to Dean Jackson's YouTube channel. He's putting out a lot of great stuff. I think he put out a video today. Go check it out. Yeah, Dean, Dean, if you want to, if like, we'll give you all our our subs. You yeah. give us all your subs. Yeah, everyone's happy. Fair and trade. Sub count <laughs> That's, That's a fair, completely yeah. fair trade. <laughs> Heck yeah! All right, you guys see this? Yep. I was a little little late on the screen share. I won't lie. It's probably looked a little weird right, there. Dude, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Uh, our viewers don't mind. So, um, this is oh, a your, your big, your big black uh, oh, arrow wow. our <laughs> cursor doesn't look too yeah. bad, dude. <laughs> yeah, let's go. I've seen, I've seen way bigger and blacker <laughs> things. <laughs> um, all right. So I actually tweeted about it a couple days ago, but I, these like studies, I, I made an account on this, this website, uh, called stork and, they basically notify notify your account or an email uh, when certain studies about or like studies about certain topics that you want come out. So this is one of the most recent ones published on the 30th of December, actually, which is, I mean, obviously very recent. Um, the effect of crow hop uh, of the crow hop on elbow stress during an interval throwing program. So this is kind of uh, aimed around rehab of UCL construct reconstruction. Um, by Dr. Lizio, Vincent A. Lizio, um, and, and a few others. In the Henry- Lizio, that's, that's, that's a famous uh, <laughs> pop star, dude. Lizzo? <laughs> yeah, and this was performed <laughs> at the uh, Henry Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. So basically what these, uh, they use the MODIS sensor to record uh, basically kinematics and kinetics. Um, they wanted, they used high school and college pitchers to basically test an interval throwing program at 30, 60, 90, or no, was it 30, 45, 60, 90, 120, 150, and 180 feet uh, of catch. They wanted to see the effects of a crow hop on the modus metrics. Mm. So um, the four or the f- four modus metrics and then velocity. So, um, so there's uh, the velocity of the ball being thrown. There's arm stress or arm torque. There's arm slot, there's shoulder rotation, and arm speed. Um, and basically, they had people, they had these subjects throw, uh, they instructed them to throw on an arc with just enough velocity to get it to the target because that's kind of similar to, uh, Anthony could probably talk more yeah. about the, the programs. I think that's uh, like the that, word for word like description in the return to throwing programs. Yeah, so they like not they're not trying to blow it out. You're trying to just get it to yeah. to your target, and uh, they want it because I guess there's some other research that it, that states that using a crow hop can reduce elbow load or arm load because you're like using your lower body more. Yeah, um, or, more the, like or that's momentum. the theory or whatever. Um, but basically, these guys, these or this group wanted to test that. Oh uh, so wow! Gonna, Wait. I just thought of a really hot take because of that. Running guns are actually the mo- like least stressful throw <laughs> because you sprint yeah. into them. That's fire! Yeah. You're oh using my your gosh! Body. You're really, really getting into it. We just figured that out. Like what? We've been going about this all wrong. We don't have to defend the stress <laughs> in running guns because they're clearly less stressful because you sprint into them. Oh my god! <laughs> we just seen that markers to stay on for a couple sprints and also have that be in the lab. <laughs> Yeah. Have yeah. the lab be like thirty yards long, so someone can can sprint in with the markers. That's true, dude. If Dean's still in here, Dean's been asking if we can uh, mocap uh, running guns. So yeah, that's, we're, we're almost we were, we were trying to set that up when we were in Arizona. In Arizona, nice. Sh- should a mocap uh, our mile race, Lindley? <laughs> yeah, once every lap, we just run through the lab every lap. <laughs> all right. Um, so basically, all the subjects through at these various distances. 
um, three throws with a crow hop and three throws without. And, com- and basically using ANOVA to compare differences in uh, the, five, the five metrics. So velocity and then the four modus metrics. And they found that um, a, crow hop, a crow hop had significantly higher torque for 30, 45, and 60 feet. But mm. uh, everything longer than 90 feet, a crow hop did not result in higher uh, modus torque. So oh, wow. mm. it's kind of, kind of interesting. I imagine like to me, it, it seems kind of like a, it kind of makes sense uh, because I mean, pe- people might just be throwing harder, uh, which was the case. Ball velocity was significantly higher with the crow hop for every distance. No, not every distance, but up to 90 feet. Yeah. Um, so subjects were throwing harder they had higher arm speeds, uh, not significantly, but on on average, they had higher arm speeds with a crow hop. Yeah. Um, so it, got, it makes sense that the the modus torque was was higher. And then there were no differences in arm slot or uh, shoulder rotation for any of the any of the distances. And I think that actually I'll, I'll go through the uh, they I have this highlighted here because the the author said. Um, they speculate this, this is due to energy transfer through the kinetic chain. So like, Mm. as you crow hop, you create more energy, more energy is transferred through the body. And so more like through the, the, uh, arm joints and then effectively the, the velocity is higher. But like, I, I really think that it might just be an intent thing. Like if you, if you crow hop, you're just, just trying to throw harder. I don't know. Um, I can see, I can see that. I would think that it's just like the, your throwing mechanics are so significantly different below 90 feet. And if you, like if you crow hop at 60 feet, you're gonna, your, your mechanics are like, I would think that your mechanics would be more similar to like if you crow hopped at 120 feet, you know, like you can throw with like very different mechanics at very low intent at 30, 60, and even 90 feet. But as soon as you add like a crow hop in there, you know, you like sync up your, like your arm circle and all of that um, and the way that it deploys similarly to like throwing it, you know, uh, further distances. So I would almost think it's like a, just a, like, your kinematics change with the crow hop yeah. at, at that distance. I, I was going to say well, one quick thing. Did, is there anything about people's uh, or subjects' past experience with crow hops? Did, did, uh, did no. everyone here have like the same level of experience or like, you know, that, that realistically being like minimal experience or something? Yeah. So I'm just I would, thinking how, how much it would depend based on like someone trying it for the first time. I would, I would assume that or? if you have played baseball long enough to have Tommy John surgery, or be in like a rehab you mm-hmm. probably like crow hop this this wasn't uh this amazing. wasn't rehab pop this wasn't a rehab sample oh oh wasn't they, they just did oh, they did the rehab uh, return to throw basically yeah they did the interval training Fishing, program yeah. i believe uh they were so, recruited from, saying, then that could be a thing right it could be like people could have varying levels of experience with the crowd i'd be pretty amazed honestly oh, i'd be pretty potentially amazed. and they weren't they like no technique was uh was given for was was specified for the crow hop yeah it was just uh, no explicit instructions were given for crow hop technique. So it's just it's, like whatever they they deemed themselves as a crow hop. So it's within like, within the uh, methods, there isn't even a description of like what is a crow hop because I'd be interested to see if like, you know, if it's like the, like an Ichiro crow hop was like a, you know, like an X step, like you step behind kind of a thing or if it was like a really old school where they like step through in front. No, no. In the intro, they don't. They mm-hmm. don't like introduce the crow hop either. Interesting. Um, and then they like basically said the takeaway is that for people in in rehab, they should not do a crow hop because it's more stressful on your arm. Which like that's a fair evaluation, in my opinion. Uh, I like disagree. If you're gonna if you're gonna attend or if you're gonna tend to have higher arm arm forces, torque, stress, whatever. Uh, when you're crow hopping and and you're like supposed to minimize it, then maybe that is a is a decent takeaway. But I think uh, what my takeaway for this was that it's just like important to track stuff like this. You yeah. Know? Like if you just have people tell people to do a crow hop or whatever, it might have unintended results unless you're measuring the actual intent. So yeah. it's it's clear that they were moving faster uh, with a crow hop but they were able to like tell that because they were wearing their modus sleeve. 
just like more 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 evidence to to support using an objective measurement like that for these throwing programs whether or not this program is the right one to be using yeah or the, the most optimal one to be using for rehab i think yeah. it's it shows the importance of actually measuring it and, and especially if you don't have access to a, a radar gun because a modus sleeve is is much more accessible than a than a radar gun yeah that's on, that's honestly a really bummer take uh that that's that's kind of like where um it is i mean that's like as far as just as far as like you know uh for rehab stuff you should be wary of doing this because it um has more stress kind of a thing like yeah i i it is just like a very frustrating uh thing in like baseball research and like specifically with rehab that like we just look at stress as an absolute of more equal bad less equal good when if we applied that to every training program modality whatever we tried to do in baseball all of our athletes would just sit on the couch yeah, because yeah, the only sure. way to improve performance and like throw better get stronger is to increase the amount of stress you experience and then recover and compensate uh and like adapt to that if you look at like any other field and exercise strength, like if you look at strength and conditioning and every single paper that talked about like different weightlifting techniques, if at the end the discussion was like, oh, this was more stressful. So like, don't do this. It would, you know, that's, that's like the exact opposite. Like, yes, they <clears throat> probably experience more stress in that setting or in that like rep scheme or whatever, but then also ultimately their performance increased later on. Like, you know, that's, uh, that's a bummer, bummer take. Yeah. It's still, it's still like the same, same argument that we see with velo and, and elbow stress or arm stress. Right. It's yeah. just like, it's, it's not an unfair take. It's just not like, you're not seeing the whole picture. And like, as far as longitudinal, like actual results and application, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yep. Just like the whole thing is if you, if you're minimizing tort or the arm stress, just don't throw as hard or don't throw at all. Exactly. Um, so like it's not I mean you're not wrong. Yeah. But, uh so you could do a yeah. you could do, you could do a controlled study of we just have we have 10 people uh play long toss with the modus on and then we have 10 people sit down and do nothing with the modus <laughs> on and then we could we could run a test and see what the p value is of zero stress versus the stress that was experienced in long toss. I mean, dude, you know I bet it would be significant, and I bet we'd we'd see that the people who didn't throw experience like no to little stress. I mean, yeah, yeah. that's the rehab program right there. There's no stress. Yeah, and they cited uh, they cited our validation. I was about to uh, say that's the part that stuck at me. Let's go, Bodie at all. Eighteen, and uh, there was this other one that had our values. Uh, Pearson R values for like between 0.86 and 0.95, and they they question the methodology. I didn't actually look into that reference and, and what they're referring to, but uh, yeah, I like guess cool. There was also this uh, another study that was, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing anything. Oh, stop sharing. Um, there's also another study that looked at the difference published within, I think, a month looking at the difference between mount and flat ground throws with the modus with the modus sensor. Um, so maybe we can make and discuss that one at a later time. But oh yeah, I like cool that. stuff. I I don't know I don't know how I feel. Uh, I think modus seems to be best uh, used in the applied setting. Um, but I think in this case it was it's good. And I think again, my main takeaway is just that it's a, it could be a great tool for monitoring uh, workload, whether it's in rehab or in like shooting performance for performance at, at max intent when somebody's fully on ramped. Yeah. That's actually a really good way to look at it. Like, uh, using, you know, and instead of looking at more stress, bad, less stress, good look at, mm -hmm. you know, the application of modus as, um, still trying to just like figure out what is good, what is bad and monitoring that like you're, this is like, they're kind of like operating under the, under that assumption that like more stress is just bad when mm -hmm. there's probably more valuable findings or like potential theoretical implications that they could come to, uh, with that data set. But it's just like, Oh, stress was significantly higher. 
don't grow up. That's like, come yeah. on. Yeah, that's true. It's, I mean, it's like, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even confident that this group, and maybe, maybe, maybe it is a, it is a health system. Um, maybe, maybe that is their like most, uh, important takeaway, but it's like, it's in the journal of sports medicine and, like it's probably kind of tough to get published if you don't mention that uh, as like a potential finding, you know? Yeah. Which is kind of a sucky part of the whole academic bureaucracy and in, in, in publishing peer-reviewed research papers in general. Oh yeah, yeah, that's tough. So that's tough. Oh yeah, what else? What do we got, boys? I, I think it's a wrap, dude. Unless we got Dean in there for uh <laughs> for one more question. Oh, he, just I, said, he just said mocap pull downs, baby. <laughs> I actually just pulled up uh just showed up up in Slack. Stop ruining your training with recovery days. Shout out, Dean. This is the latest uh, New Dean Jackson YouTube video. Everyone go check it out. <laughs> Let's go. Well again, dude, we've gotta do some sort of deal. Like we, like Dean, we told everyone to come <laughs> check it out. So yeah. we wanna hear some plugs. We wanna hear some plugs in your next video, man. Yep. Podcast uh, views better double next next and, episode. And and let us know what your thumb who your thumbnail person is, dude. Cause cause we're definitely interested in that. <laughs> D- D- Dean's thumbnails, he's like, Are you training hard enough? He's like <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna we're gonna screenshot that and then make that the yeah, thumbnail yeah. for today's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh dude, yeah, you, you want me to hold it? You want me to hold it for the screenshot? I, you already held it. It's a screenshot. You don't have to hold it. <laughs> you can get it in passing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh man, let's go! First episode of 2021. Let's go! This is our year, boys. Nice. Oh, oh, Dean said, Dean said, plugs for days. Plugs for days. I mean, let's go. That was solid. Right. First episode of 2021. You guys got anything else? You want to sign off? Bart, next week. Don't forget to sign up for Arizona and Texas training. Mention Ooh, yeah, the boys, week, the RD podcast. Please, please, yeah, please mention us. Like I said, we we will we will definitely. Yeah. I promise you we'll pay at least some of your training if yeah. you don't get it. Ten percent off minimum, you know. I was gonna say ten percent off maximum, but either way, we will pay some we will ten percent off minimum. Training. Honestly, if you catch Caravan and I at the right time, you know, if you hit us with that Venmo, it could be a hundred percent off. I don't we'll, know. we'll be your sugar daddies. <laughs> we'll be your sugar daddies. The way that the way that Bitcoin's going, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I still have all my money in Ripple, dude. That doesn't that does not affect me. Okay, yeah, never mind. Go ahead, can't help. <laughs> all right, that's it. That's all it for right. the pod. Next week, uh, Barton Smith. See you later, See everyone. Guys. Peace. Peace out. Peace. Thank you.